This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet and Nick Martin. I thank you both so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. So we are talking now with Mr. Mark Brady, and uh, you're in the midst of a snowstorm. Well, we are. We're in the middle of Colorado, 8,000 feet, uh, expecting up to eight inches of snow tonight, today, t- t- tonight and tomorrow. Wow. So, All right. Well, cool. t- g- give us a little background on these stories you're going to tell us. Okay. Um, I, I'll take this from a Jeff Ritzman perspective is that Well, my parents, you know, my home life, uh, my parents always got along with each other. We've always lived as a very liminal, lived in a very liminal area. Um, Two aspects is my father was an American diplomat, so we moved around a lot as a kid. So first, first 18 years, we lived in Iran, Indonesia, Taiwan, Philippines, which we'll get to, South Korea, and the United States, specifically Michigan. The oh. um, thing about that is we're always on the outside looking in. We're never really part of the culture. You know, we weren't grounded. But when we came back to the States, we were really part of the U.S. culture either since, you know, most of my friends in the States didn't know what I was talking about when we would mention a lot of things. Mm. And they still don't. The other thing... Um, about that is that there was a lot of disruption in that every summer we moved or at least half our friends moved and so there was a lot of there was no really you know long-term friendship so to speak though we did have these weird synchronicities like the lady who lived behind me in the philippines moved to new delhi but when we got off the plane in korea she was the first person i saw because she had moved there the year before So, it's one of those small worlds, but big worlds. Yeah. But the the term for it is third culture kid, TCK, because you're never really, really part of anything. So, once I heard Jeff Richmond, I may have been you, on your show, talk about it, is, you know, there's that sense of detachment, lack of being grounded. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that I'm also multiracial, my mom was Japanese American. She got put in an internment camp oh. in Idaho and moved got relocated eventually to Michigan. My father, on the other hand, was from West Virginia, ran away from joined the army, ended up in Japan and then the Korean War, then went to school at the University of Michigan where my parents met. And there was always that sense of not quite being multiracial, not quite fitting into any one particular race, and then also being Asian, there's that sense of detachment there. For example, in the Elks Club on the West Coast, we couldn't join because they were considered as colored. Hmm. But when we were in Maryland, we went to a movie theater in Maryland. I even remember the movie. It was uh, Magnificent Men in the Flying Machines. It was like 67 or 66, we couldn't sit in the balcony because that was reserved for colored people <laughs> and we were considered white. So it's just wow. that kind of that gray, gray area. My parents' marriage was illegal in some states until 1967. So wow. again, you have that not really being there, not being part of it, things. But, and also the other thing is my parents were into Edgar Casey, Ruth Montgomery, the People, you know, were big in the 60s, so that kind of Mm -hmm. carried on. And um, that's part of the reason that, you know, I guess I've been open to these experiences and um, not surprised when they show up. (laughs) So the 
most of my career I've been a risk manager so for a large bank and so there's always been grays you know, you know there's no black and white in risk management right and then I'm I'm retired now so we live in well I said we lived in Colorado we're on the other side you know Chris O'Brien's mysterious valley right mm mm-hmm. We're on, the, we're on the other side of the mountains from that valley. We're on the Wet Mountain Valley, the valley that has all the um, various interesting things happening. Uh, is the San Luis Valley, and it's we have thing, incidents here, but nothing in the na- neighborhood that the San Luis Valley has. So it's kind of an interesting place we ended up. Yeah. But First story I wanted to share was one everyone had heard of, has heard of, but I wanted to get my perspective. And that's the Phoenix Lights, and why when I we worked, we lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and specifically we lived at Thirty Second and Shea, which is right in the middle of town. Um, the interesting thing about where we lived is that it's on the runway approach path. So we moved there in 1996, and March 13, 1997, uh, when I was going out to my car to get some um, paperwork, and I saw the, I would say, I I remember it as seven lights in the sky forming a, um, not quite a triangle, but essentially a flying wing. They were coming in, the thing that I want to note is that they were coming down the approach path that all the other planes that go into Sky Harbor come down. So we're, I'm sitting up there, I look up, look up at it. Again, this is in the center of town and it's coming south. So I run through my house, go to the backyard and the lights had come overhead going along, um, actually towards straight towards the airport my wife who's an engineer was in the back working on the sprinkler system so i pointed them out to her it was already dark it was and so we both saw the phoenix lights going overhead through our house and going towards the airport the thing i i know when it note is that apparently at least i haven't heard of it no one at the airport ever saw those lights even though it was a huge formation and it was going straight towards the airport and they probably couldn't have missed it if it went overhead and they were uh, I don't remember so I can't say if there are seven lights or one giant wing with seven lights on it so that I'll have to defer could you actually see like a physical craft or only the lights? Like outline? only lights. Yeah. And I, and my, you know, it's been so long and my memory doesn't, um, I couldn't tell. And that Phoenix is pretty well lit up with all the street lights. So I couldn't tell if they're blocking out the stars or not. Mm, okay. But the, again, it was coming down, a airport approach path it was probably appeared to be two or three thousand feet in the sky and headed straight for the airport so i know there's been mention of the light flares over the gunnery range but yeah. this clearly clearly came over from the north i ran through my house saw it departing to the south and my wife saw it too along with thousands of other people hmm. the other thing that um always mention in you know maybe it's because i grew up in such a liminal state is it never really changed my life i know other people have said they've seen you know other lights but we haven't seen any lights since then and can't really say that it's altered our life in any meaningful way it's just one of those experiences you kind of look at and go huh that's neat yeah yeah it's just an interesting thing to have seen yeah so but I can say they were there, and it was definitely over the center of Phoenix. That's that's what I can add to this discussion. <laughs> okay. All right. So where do you want to go next? So, second story that people might find of interest, completely different aspect, but maybe it's all the same phenomena. But 
we were stationed in the Philippines at the time. Um, um, and being Philippines at the time, the, the American embassy in Manila was a huge complex because there were a lot of families where the husband was in Vietnam and the wife and kids were in Manila. So um, there was all the accoutrements of have essentially a small U.S. town. One of the aspects was that there was a Boy Scout troop that the embassy ran, Troop 451, and the lucky one of the Marine, actually it's two of the Marines in the embassy Marines were assigned as scout masters because they had been Boy Scouts. And they decided they wanted to organize a trip to Corregidor Island, which is this island that guards the entrance to Manila Bay. Now, during World War II, it was the site of two battles. First battle was when the United States was losing the Philippines to the Japanese army. It was a MacArthur's final command post in the Philippines, hmm. and he they evacuated him out on out on a submarine from Cregador, and then I don't know the exact dates, but several months later, the island fell to a Japanese attack, and then in 1944, 1945, when the U.S. were retaking it, um, a bunch of paratroops were dropped on it, and there was another battle. And the U.S. managed to take the island back, but, you know, with a significant loss of life on the Japanese side. Mm. So right now, when we went out, it was still being um, demined, demilitarized, all that good stuff. There were stacks of ammunition around that they were still diffusing and finding. Yeah. So... Our scoutmaster decided, hey, that would be a neat place to send a bunch of Boy Scouts out. <laughs> um, so we actually went out. They have a hovercraft, or, or you could get a military ve vessel, and very informal in those days. So we just went out, set up our camp tents on this area called Bottom Side. It's a big area, all open, um, visible for dozens of yards. So... But being the Marines, they be having Marines as scoutmasters, they organized this into watches, and I managed to get the 4 a.m. to uh, 8 a.m. watch. <laughs> Not that there were any one really was going to pilfer from our thing, but that's just what Marines do. Right. There was another guy on watch with me, and he fell asleep. So I was wandering around camp and got to see the sunrise. And so... Being a semi-tourist attraction, there were soft drink stands um, right by the pier, which was about 200 yards away. So I, wa I started walking towards the soft drink stands to, and the beach, and I turned around in the middle of the parade field. I saw this lady in white. I thought she was a vendor. So I went back and started walking towards the stand, looked back, and she was still standing in the middle of the parade field. So I was kind of confused because, you know, if she was a vendor, she probably would have hurried over to make the sale. Mm -hmm. But I looked away, and then I looked back, she was gone. You know, she literally disappeared. Nowhere she could have run because it was a giant open area. And um, never saw her again, so to speak. Huh. And then as a postscript, a year later, I found a book that had just been published after my experience, books called Cregador, uh, Ghost, Glory, and Gold. It was by an American author. And one of the final chapters, she recall, recounts going to Cregador to do her research and starting to run into stories with people there running into this same phenomena. Apparently, there's a ghost in Cregador. It's been given a name. Her name was Mita, and she's been seen all over the island. I just happened to see her in Bottom Side, but the lady put together a series of stories recounting this ghost's appearance. And so I can say I've, se I've seen her too. And actually, in some ways, you know, a impressionable young mind, that was kind of spookier than anything I had read about because <laughs> there it was. I'd actually seen it. Other people verified it after the fact that they've been having similar encounters. 
So they're different stories, but they mostly revolve around persons since she was wearing all white, being a nurse and either being killed or captured or, you know, waiting for somebody who had been killed or captured in uh, the battlefield. Mm. And so she's apparently stuck to the place. So mm. that, that's my ghost story, so to speak. That's cool. But the third listener story, and this is kind of an, a different tangent, is that my friend, Ben, this was back in the late 90s, she had a stillborn son. Mm. And that event happened in December 18th. Now, I know, I know it really traumatized her, and she was having trouble dealing with it, and she actually left the Catholic Church because of it, because the helpful priest said, well, your child is going to hell because he's not baptized, <sighs> but we can't baptize him because he's dead. And it's kind of like that was her break with the Catholic Church. Understandable. But, you know, like an event like that, it's very traumatizing. And she's told me, the, told me that it was you know, December 18th. So... I, one December 18th, a few years later, I want to say six late years later, mm -hmm. um, I get this dream. It was a Sunday, and I dream, dreamt it was her son. And her son said, I'm, I think I'm like you. I'm a late sleeper. So 8.25 in the morning, I get this dream that the son said, get out of bed and call Heidi, my friend. And she has, she's given me permission to pass on the story. And so, totally groggy, pick up the phone, call, and say, I just had this dream. And she's kind of like, okay. <laughs> then you hear the kitchen, kitchen timer go off. And she goes, you hear that kitchen timer? I said, yeah. And she said... That was the exact time he passed away, and I always commemorate it. But I've never told anyone else the time, so how in the world did you know? I'm going, that was my dream. You know me. She knows me well enough that other, all other occasions, I would be sleeping at that time. <laughs> so wow. that was one of those visitation moments. But again, uh, knowledge I didn't have. Yeah, and then it made a difference to her. Yeah. And as another po postscript, I was telling this story. I was in a dream group when I was in Phoenix, and I was telling this story. And I mentioned the December 18th, and one of the ladies in the dream group just kind of got all quiet, and she goes, um, kind of got all whatever got quiet and then eventually asked me and she goes you don't know this or told me this she goes you don't know this but my son also passed away at 20 on december 18th and she thought it was incredible it was the, she was just there as a guest and that come in this dream group to hear that there's story of information coming after death yeah of somebody who december, died on december 18th just kind of I think made her more comfortable that there is something past there, at least information getting through. So, yeah. Again, I think it helped her too. So, that's, well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But it's one of those, I think everyone has these sort of stories. Maybe I'm more open to them because I'm more or less grounded in anything, but. Oh. You know, I, I hear these, I hear other people talk about these stories, so I figured I wanted to share mine just so people knew that there are a lot of things out there and um, they shouldn't be afraid of sharing their stories. And uh, your, your podcast is probably a great place for it. Well, thank you. And I'm glad you did because those, those are very interesting. Anyway, I appreciate you giving me time for. Um, passing these on and hopefully there's another person out there where this will help or not help, but <laughs> I, um, yeah. 
they're always it's one of those life is interesting you've just got to look around for the stories that go with it so fair enough fair enough well thank you so much mark thank you for having me and where did the road go would not be possible without the help of our patreons and uh especially those patrons pledging ten dollars or more allison cook Lindsay marie trebet nick martin super inframan ufo weekly news tim 36 dingo maria jennifer campbell mike mcguire american rambler paul buscini nate syria anthony sullivan kevin john rutledge foster the third eric citron ben crow janet runyon andy mcmanara sasha lorg matthias sunby christopher vaughn Riker and stark robert groom sean cosgrove jose a roger gonzalez Craig Cicernos, Kevin Shrek, A.E. Gaia Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris, Isa Hot Dog a Sandwich, John Eddy, Carla Mahoney, and Chris Johnson. Thank you all so very much. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>